EKG Burst Part 6. Carotid sinus massage can terminate these types of supraventricular tachycardias. These SVTs can be terminated with carotid massage. Number one, sinus node reentrant tachycardia. Number two, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, AVNRT. Number three, orthodromic AV reentrant tachycardia. And number four, antidromic AV reentrant tachycardia. So I know carotid massage may sound like the very poor man's way of including or excluding SVTs, but keep in mind that SVTs can be incredibly hard to diagnose without electrophysiologic testing. So I wouldn't forget about this maneuver. And does atrial flutter respond to carotid massage? Yes, flutter responds to massage, but it typically is not terminated by carotid massage like the previous rhythms just mentioned. Atrial flutter typically responds to massage of the carotid sinus with a decrease in ventricular rate, but will immediately return to baseline upon termination of this maneuver. Atrial flutter with a 1 to 1 conduction ratio often looks like this rhythm. VTAC. VTAC and atrial flutter with a 1 to 1 conduction ratio look similar. So in this scenario, you could consider carotid massage to try and slow the ventricular rate, and this might reveal a flutter with a 2 to 1 block at half the rate of the first electrocardiogram. Atrial flutter waves are typically upright in this lead and inverted in this other lead. Where do you see upright flutter waves? V1. Where do you see inverted flutter waves? The inferior leads, and probably most notable in lead 2. Upright flutter waves are found in V1, inverted flutter waves in lead 2. In addition, atrial flutter waves are usually best seen in V1 and the inferior leads as well. So if you suspect atrial flutter, there is good reason to look at V1 and the inferior leads. In atrial fibrillation, atrial activity is best seen in which leads? V1, V2, V3, the inferior leads, just like atrial flutter. Atrial activity, whether you are looking at atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter or fib flutter for that matter, is seen best in the inferior leads and V1 to V3. Rightward axis, large P waves in lead two and increased QRS voltage in the inferior leads can be found in these types of people. Athletes, right, well-trained athletes. Rightward axis, large P waves in lead two and increased QRS voltage in the inferior leads are consistent with a vertical heart physiologic hypertrophy and a thin body habitus. In these hearts, the rightward shift does tend to be rather subtle with an axis less than 120 degrees. And if the axis is less than 120, will AVR be positive or negative? AVR will be negative if the axis is less than 120 degrees. So anywhere from negative 60 to 120, AVR is negative. AVR will be positive if the axis is greater than 120. So in athletes with a vertical heart, AVR should be negative. And don't forget about prominent inferior voltage either. That's important too. What does the U wave represent on ECG? Controversial in origin, the U wave is thought to represent either after potentials of the ventricular myocardium or repolarization of Purkinje fibers. They are rarely seen when the heart rate exceeds 90 beats per minute, usually because they get buried in the preceding T wave, so I wouldn't even look for them if the patient is tachycardic. And in which leads are U waves usually the tallest? Look for U waves in V2 and V3. And finally, what is the definition of a prominent U wave? A prominent U wave is any amplitude greater than 1.5 millimeters. Digoxin can cause many changes on the electrocardiogram, but what is the characteristic ST segment finding? And know that this does not indicate toxicity per se. Digoxin can cause an oddly shaped ST depression with upward concavity, so a smile rather than a frown, 
and it sort of has a scooping appearance. Reverse tick sign is another buzzword, and tick just refers to a check mark or dash symbol, not the little bugs that cause Lyme disease. ST segment depression, again, this does not imply toxicity. Also, PR interval can be prolonged with digoxin therapy. And what about the QT interval? You should know about this as well. It is shortened. The short QT with scooping of the ST segment is typical of digitalis effect, not digitalis toxicity. T-wave abnormalities also, so T-wave flattening, inversion, and biphasic T-waves. Dig can also increase the U-wave amplitude as well. Now what I really want you to take home from the, this discussion is when to recognize signs of digoxin overdose. So early on your patients may complain of nausea, vomiting, or maybe diarrhea. And in chronic toxicity, confusion and visual changes can occur. And these obviously are an inconvenience, but the cardiac manifestations are what you really need to worry about and look for. Early ECG changes include extra systoles and minor AV nodal blocks. Later on, you may begin to see more severe second and third degree heart blocks, supraventricular tachycardias, for example, junctional and atrial tachycardias, and ventricular tachycardias. And those are caused by increased automaticity as well as early and late after depolarizations. VTAC is complicated by high mortality rates in these patients, so they should immediately be treated with um, digoxin FAB fragments or magnesium in the very least. So remember, there are clear distinctions between digitalis effect versus digitalis toxicity, and you need to know these because they are very important. <laughs>